I got a microphone too. Wow, microphone and a clicker. I run around a lot, so this is going to be very dangerous for me. So, so first of all, what I always like to do is get an understanding who I'm talking to, because I'm doing this not for me, but obviously for you guys. So if you would all please stand up for me, if you could. Come on, that's going to be your exercise for the week. So everybody who owns a crypto kitty may sit down already. No one? Wow, okay. Everybody who owns Ether may sit down. And now everybody who owns Bitcoin may sit down too. Wow, quite a few noobs in the room. Okay, you may all sit down now. All right, yeah, as my uh, introductory person here said earlier, I represent a venture fund called Sustainy Capital. We are based in Orange County, Newport Beach specifically. We have been in technology investing for about 20 years, and for the past couple of years, we have been exclusively focusing on the blockchain space. I used to be a lawyer, don't hold this against me. I was a lawyer for a very short period of time. After I came out of law school, I joined an ISP, which we thankfully sold at the height of the dot com. So then I retired from the law 20 years ago and moved to Southern California to join my first technology venture fund. We were originally very much focused on things like voice over IP and multi-massive online player games. So when this particular topic came around, it very much fit what we already liked to see in the world and like to invest in. So needless to say, I'm presenting to you the tech investor's perspective. So we have the unique fortune, if you will, that we see a couple of hundred projects a year, so a few thousand projects over the past couple of years. So from that perspective, what we are looking for, and that hence our name Sustany, is sustainable development specifically. So, as I mentioned, I was a lawyer for a brief period of time, hence disclaimer, first disclaimer. None of what I'm going to tell you is in any form investment advice and obviously not legal advice. Second disclaimer, I have never been related to or will be related to any of the California governors, including those who may or may not have played a killer Robert in the past. All right, so if you haven't read this particular paper yet, Please do, and please read the title a few times. I experience technology startups on a daily basis who either haven't read it or haven't read it thoroughly. The title is really important, and specifically, unfortunately, the part that's really small, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. There's a lot of confusion about what blockchain is. There's a lot of confusion about Bitcoin is, and a lot of that has to do with just vocabulary. So unfortunately, I have to talk about this a little bit to make somewhat sense. So first of all, it's very important to understand what did blockchain actually introduce. So as far as we are concerned, there's two or three really important inventions that you want to utilize in that particular technology paradigm. The first of all is the digital bearer instrument. So what Bitcoin or the Bitcoin white paper specifically introduced is not blockchain technology. Blockchain technology has been around and is actually mentioned in the Bitcoin white paper in the second footnote and um, was a concept developed 10 years prior and wasn't called blockchain technology then and actually the Bitcoin white paper doesn't make mention of blockchain technology either but this, this is what we have become to call it. Secondly, and that's based on the prior concept of digital bearer instrument is the concept of smart contracts. If, a few people in the room hopefully know uh, Vitaly Buterin, the inventor of Ethereum, was initially trying to build a sm smart contract system on Bitcoin specifically, and it was too complicated, so he decided I'm going to develop a new smart contract system itself, and that is now known as Ethereum. By the way, you cannot buy Ethereum, you can only buy Ether, the asset on top of it. It's one of my pet peeves. And then lastly, and what might become most important, is the concept of DAOs, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. And I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that because there's not much uh, to report on outside of the fact that Bitcoin itself, the Bitcoin blockchain, is probably the only really viable DAO thus far. Okay, so as an investor, what we're looking for first and foremost when someone presents to us what they are trying to build is what problem are you solving? And then also, how are people are going to pay you for 
solving this particular problem. And blockchain basically off the, off the get-go is addressing a very specific problem and Satoshi mentioned this in the title as in it's addressing cash and it's also addressing banking. So most of the companies that we've seen over the past five years in one way or another uh, present this to us as the particular problem. This is probably incorrect, I'm going to get into this, but maybe real quick to summarize what the functions of these particular instruments are. So on the right side you see um, the typical bearer instrument, so the cash you have in your pocket. What's really great about bearer instruments is you hand it over to someone and it settles the transaction with very little counterparty risk. There's two concepts, and one concept we buried in 1971, which is the concept of this digital bearer instrument, or this bearer instrument specifically, being backed by a commodity, commodity-backed money. It used to say you can exchange this against a certain quality and quantity of silver, and obviously that's no longer the case since 1971. So even we call this still the US dollar today, when Nixon introduced his new idea of, well, we don't really have to comply with these um, old measures anymore, Really what we created is an entirely different instrument. Uh, fun fact, if you have a quarter that was minted before that day, it, this particular quarter bought you a gallon of gas back in 1970 to still, today it still does because of the silver that's included into that. Obviously the same doesn't hold true for that paper. So then these are the solutions that have been proposed to us. I like to use um, that particular image of a vending machine for smart contracts. Think of, con uh, of smart contract as digital vending machines. You use another digital element, i.e. a token on, uh, depicted on the right, to insert into that particular vending machine, and out comes whatever result um, that particular vendor has to offer. And if you notice there's a little fish on there, and for those who know the Hitchhiker's Guide Through the Galaxy, you know what that means. No one, okay, terrific. So, unfortunately, we have come to call these things cryptocurrencies, a terrible, terrible, terrible term that has led to a lot of confusions, and these confusions now include the regulators. I'm going to get into this some more. So, but first of all, it's super important that everybody understands money. I'm super happy that we're finally having a discussion around money because money is one of the most misunderstood concepts. That's mainly because we stuck to a definition that was created in 1875 by this gentleman, Javons, and that included those four prongs, a medium of exchange, a unit of account, a standard, and a store of value. In the time of Javons, we had commodity and commodity-backed money. What we didn't have is computers, what we didn't have is anything else that had to do with more efficient currency transfer. And currency is something that's very different from money. I'm going to explain. So this is your current bank account. Your bank account is a ledger. If you transfer, quote unquote, money to someone else, what happens? Your bank adjusts your ledger, and the bank of the recipient adjusts the ledger of the recipient. Using what? Bytes. What this tells you, the default medium of exchange are bytes. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. This is the actual problem. I have a cow, I have a beer, and the barkeep doesn't have a change for a cow. Cow is short, coincidence of one's problem, or more simply speaking, the barter problem. It's one of the most difficult problems in societies to solve. And we chose technology, i.e. money, as being one example to solve this problem. The problem is that of currency, meaning the problem of value exchange. So I'd like you to remember, currencies and money are not the same. Currencies are systems of value exchange solving the barter problem. Money is one technology, and guess what? We don't need it anymore, because if you guys have a digital wallet, right, what do you see? You see your Bitcoin holdings, you see your Ether holdings, your Bitcoin cash and so forth. And what else do you see? You see a translation. A translation into the language of money that you understand. So you see a translation into US dollar, 
you might see a translation into euro. Did it change the medium of exchange? It didn't. It still bites, even if it's yen. So for five years now, I get emails every single day. Cryptocurrency adoption, blockchain adoption. This is one of the most common mistakes entrepreneurs make, technologies entrepreneurs in particular. It's the idea that people will adopt my technology. They don't. Your job as technologist is to adapt the technology to the user. Very simple example. People did not adopt voice of IP. They adopted Skype. So now you talk to someone and you ask them, are you using voice of IP? And they will tell you, no. And you ask them, do you use WhatsApp? Yes. Well, you're using voice of IP. Who cares? So you will never see any Bitcoin price on any banana or car. So what we need, what we need is money over IP. What's money over IP? Money over IP doesn't care in what language something is priced. Right? You don't care if you're going to England if a Coke is priced in British pound sterling. You want to understand what it costs you in your language of trade. So what we need to build and what we're finally seeing to emerge are these universal apps that do this translation for you. And since the function have separated, at no point in time in the future should you be able or should you hold any inflationary currencies, i.e. US dollar, for more than a second, other than when you use it for payment. What do I mean by that? Remember, fiat is not a store of value. It hasn't been for decades. We don't think of it this way. The simple example I always make is you, you don't keep a million dollars in your checking account. Why? Because it's going to be less at the end of the year. You invest it into something where you actually store your value in. This technology will allow you to do this without thinking about it. So money being the simplest, digital instrument for blockchains to solve. A little more complicated because money is fungible and non-fungible because it carries much more information. That's why I was asking earlier about crypto kitties and no one owns one. That is surprising, but anyway. Um, a crypto kitty was sold for as much as $140,000. This is a very unique item created by a particular artist and it exists only once in digital form. And by the way, this is one of the very few new assets that were being created. A lot of times people throw this term around digital assets. There's very few of those. I'm going to explain more. So what we're already seeing is digital assets within game environments that can be transferred across different games that you can own now, that you can sell peer-to-peer. -peer. And what I'm waiting for, that's a call to action, give me a decentralized YouTube. Give me software that lets me own my MP3 files, my MP4 files. This used to be the case. I could buy CDs, and if I didn't like it anymore, I could sell it to you for either less or more, depending on the rarity of that item. That doesn't exist anymore. You download something from iTunes, what do you get? A limited license, right? And if you leave the ecosystem, you lose your content. That should no longer happen, and this is possible with this particular technology. So the next question, and you see this probably all the time right now, tokenize the world. Tokenize real estate and cars and security tokens. Unfortunately, we're far away from that. The current state of the technology provides for very, very simple protocols. However, what we see in the very near future is the following, assets of IP. So already I can create a new and unique item on a blockchain, I showed you that earlier. And typically when you see those, they can be symbolized by a QR code like this, for example. So an example that we mapped out specifically because we would like to see this in the world is like how do you transfer assets? How do you follow an asset along in the real world and in the virtual world? You can create an asset in the virtual world first start creating a market and pre-sell it. That's why we use this, uh, this particular example of a wine bottle. Think about it this way. 
if I have a vineyard that produces on average 50,000 bottles of wine every year, I can pre-sell individual bottles on a blockchain-based implementation. I can then use Ethereum as one example to transfer that to a particular person, transfer the private key to that particular person, and track that particular item when it actually instantiates on another blockchain all the way down to the store to when you buy that particular item you can see it in your app and it re represents the actual physical item that you're buying with its provenance with its history with how many of these items were initially produced how many are still in circulation and so forth I think it's probably easy to see how this can provide value for everybody here and how you can immediately create a resale market that doesn't depend on any particular retailer. So we in invest in three main topics. This is the third one, identity. Right after law school, I taught privacy rights and for a very short period of time. And then I moved here in 2000 and was shocked, just really shocked what companies could do with your data here. A lot of the things that TransUnion, Equifax, and so forth do would be utterly illegal where I am from. Those individuals would be in prison for like aggregating your data and selling your personal and financial data. That couldn't happen. Now, fortunately, we have a little more awareness about this. As you probably heard, Europe um, issued very drastic privacy protection laws called the Journal Data Protection Rights, GDPR. And California, by the way, is about to invoke the same come January 1st, giving Californians very similar rights to their own identity. Because as you know, right now we have companies whose sole business is to sell you. We don't have a search engine. We have an advertising company that sells your data masking as a search engine. This needs to stop. Also, another area that blockchain will disrupt is the quote-unquote sharing economy. Right now when you're sharing, you're typically sharing mostly with the Ubers and Airbnbs, not so much with your fellow man. Blockchain-based solutions will allow, we already see the first decentralized ride share applications across Canada, to you directly sell to another person without that particular company interacting as a middleman that's rent-seeking. Also, as a side note, if any of you or any of your employers invested in fintech, fintech was a marketing term before blockchain came around, typically used for what I would consider window treatment to old world financial systems. Because they were all still using ACH, SWIFT, and so forth, the systems that we've been using for decades. And they were just, again, just interfaces to those. With blockchain-based solutions, you won't need this. Hence, quote unquote, legacy FinTech is the first going to be disrupted. So what, what are we looking for? The missing protocols, to summarize. So we started out with something called an internet protocol that lets most of you now access the World Wide Web for relatively free, more or less free, file transfers, transfer protocols, transmission con control protocols, email protocols. To give you an example, if we still had to put, let's say, a stamp on every email, like we used to do in the past when we sent messages, it would exceed the GDP of the country in a matter of days. However, we decided we still allow this with money. Makes no sense. HTTP, voice of IP. Voice of IP led to you all having a small flat fee for unlimited calling. I don't think anybody's paying attention to the minutes and or the bandwidth that you guys are using. When I grew up, you had to talk really fast when you talked to someone. Thank you, Henry. We all needed that. Everybody woke up? Good. So the emergence of voice over IP technology forced telecommunication companies to abandon their meetup model to the extent where we all carry phones now in our pocket that let us play phone call for a flat fee of 50, 60 bucks a month. 
So this is what we need most, and this is the easiest thing, as I mentioned, for blockchains to address. Money. Because as I mentioned earlier, you saw that, you all right now, if you have a bank account, you have a ledger. And that goes back to the fact and miscommunication that you hear a lot right now, where the legacy providers will sell to you that a blockchain is a distributed ledger technology. It is not. That is the ledger. And that is the legacy technology that blockchain is disrupting indeed. And by the way, money is the easiest. But we're looking forward to create more complex protocols addressing asset transfer and identity. There was a relatively famous, at least by our measures in the VC community, graph um, introduced by one of the VCs from the Bay Area that looked like this, where all the value that was being created in the past on application layers would move to the, product, would move to the protocol layer. Unfortunately, it's false, so I updated it a little bit. Oh, I got five minutes left, very good. I need to talk even faster. Um, so the application layers right now, as far as we are perceiving them, are made up of things like JP Morgan Chase and the Googles and the Facebooks and the Ubers. And where we are right now, hence the timeline below, is very simple. Bitcoin is one of the very few assets that exists on blockchains. And the other one being NFTs, CryptoKitty being the most prominent example. And here it's very important to understand Bitcoin lowercase b is the mining reward. Bitcoin uppercase B is the blockchain and is the currency, the system of value exchange. Because the one thing, even though the paper is utterly brilliant, that Satoshi didn't do is create a minting function. He created a mining function. But as I showed earlier, you need minting. You need to be able to understand what something is worth. But there's no reason to create something new because the unit of account will be whatever it might be because it's just a symbol, a digital symbol. So what's the overall opportunity? These are just the most obvious one and the most near-term one. And as, if you add this up, it's a quadrillion, quadrillion dollar opportunity. This is much, much, much bigger than the in initial instantiation of the World Wide Web and Internet, because we are rebuilding the World Wide Web. And as I explained to a colleague earlier, in my considered opinion, we actually never built the World Wide Web. What we built is the commercial web. It's controlled by very few companies for access, using a filter, and by even fewer companies that make money on top of it. We're going to change this. So blockchain decentralized networks and graph technologies will build for the first time the World Wide Web and Internet. So if this was too fast, I'm sure it was. Um, I'm trying to write an article every other week or every other month or so, um, typically on Forbes. So you can find some of the concepts explained there in deeper lengths. Hacker Noon also just published uh, something that I wrote about um, the topic of currencies and money and cryptocurrencies in particular, so if you want to dive into that. Again, all of this is shared with the spirit of peer review, as in, if I'm wrong, please tell me. I'd like to know. And I'm opening up for questions. Wow, I put everybody to sleep, didn't I? You all look confused, so you must have all questions. I'm going to come to you. Hello, what is your uh, feeling of this technology used uh, within Africa? Yeah, very good point. Because um, needless to say, most people here in the room have access to modern banking tools, have credit cards, and so forth. That's not the case for the vast majority of the world. There's more than a billion people, at least, that are unbanked. There's an equal amount of people that don't have government validation co documents, so they couldn't even a bank account if they wanted to. The beauty about this is, and that's the confusion that the banks are under is, what we're looking for is financial inclusion without banks. So if you haven't heard it, look it up. There's things like M-Pesa, which is now 
the predominant tool to transfer value in Sub-Saharan Africa, more than 50% of their GDP is going to through that particular system. And there's a lot of people that never had bank accounts and that will never need a bank account. So hence, yes, um, the question is valid because this technology is way more interesting for people in the developing nations and they will leapfrog us. We will probably pay much longer for those rent-seeking intermediaries that we're all paying for, paying an inconvenience fee to send money across the country and have it disappear for 24 hours for no reason, while all of these people will transfer money instantly. Just like they leapfrogged the whole idea of having a cable going into a HUD for their rotary phone, and they all have smartphones now, so they never experience that. In a similar fashion, they will never experience banking in the fashion that we are used to and have been indoctrinated into. <laughs>